Well, hello, Redemption City. Good morning. My name is Josh Four, and welcome to what might be the strangest associate pastor candidate Sunday in history uh, due to the pandemic. Obviously, I'm not with you in person, which is 100% preferable to preaching to my wife's iPhone. But here we are. Here we are. <clears throat> Global pandemic aside, it has just been such a joy to be with you, uh, get to know you a, a little bit uh, as Camille and I have visited some uh, community groups and got to just hear really sweet stories of how you've grown together as a church over the years, how um, you love Pastor Mike, uh, how you've loved each other over the years, how you welcome people into your church family. We, that's, that was our experience of the gathering we visited pre-shutdown and uh, hearing that story from other people and how you love your city and just desire uh, to, to love it love it more uh, more fully and so i'm super super excited at the possibility of, of being able to join you in all that stuff uh, today we're, we're looking at jonah 3 <clears throat> and the story of jonah really uh, in a lot of ways just resonates uh with my life only uh in in my case it wasn't just like one second chance it was like four second chances uh, part of my story as it pertains to kind of my my ministry aspect is that uh, I decided very early on at a very young age that I would be a doctor and I would do incredible things for God while making tons of money and impressing everybody around me. That was a brilliant plan. Uh, however, in high school, <laughs> uh, there, there's kind of every year there started to be, uh, I began having these really intense feelings of being called to, to be a pastor. And the only problem was that I hated the thought of being a pastor uh, to me back then, the pastors were mooches, or pastors only worked one day a week, uh, or they just didn't produce anything actually helpful. And uh, the, at the end of the day, the idea of being a pastor just really didn't have any traction with my plan to do uh, big, impressive things and be super rich. Uh, kind of like Jonah's plan, maybe, to go to Tarshish. Like, I know you want me to go there, God, but I got this better plan, because, you know, the people in Tarshish, they need God too, right? And it's a less dangerous city, like it's better this way. Uh, and so from high school on for about four or five years, every year it seemed like there'd be a sermon or a conversation where I would just get rocked, just crushed by a sense that I was called to be a pastor. And, uh, but of course I developed a lot of good avoiding strategies, uh, mostly because I was able to baptize my idolatrous doctor vision in Christian language. Uh, and then there came a point where I finally let go of the doctor dream and repented of some of the idolatry that was tied up in it. Uh, but I couldn't let go of doing big, impressive things for God. Uh, so I told him I'd do ministry, but being a pastor in the U.S. was like junior varsity. Like, I want to go to the 1040 window where real Christians go. Uh, so I, kind of like Jonah, literally ran away over an ocean. Uh, I went to China and I was there for a while. And it was while I was in China uh, that I really fell in love with the church. I fell in love with the Bride of Christ and kind of finally quit quit running and came back to the States and just kind of settled into the long, broken road uh, to, to becoming a pastor. And so this week has just been super sweet, uh, studying Jonah 3, uh, and just marinating in, in God's mercy and have, having the Holy Spirit just bring to mind this long highlight reel uh, for my own life of where God uh, was patient with me, where he showed me mercy, where he pursued me and kept calling me away uh, away from my, uh, my, my idolatry. Uh, God's mercy is the main idea for today. This chapter we're going to dive into is it's super fascinating. It's really complex and it brings up all these questions and theological issues. Uh, and we could take a deep dive into that, and, and, but, and we'll look at some of that. But as we look at some of those things, my prayer is that we wouldn't miss God, that we wouldn't miss our merciful Father revealing his character to us, revealing the way he relates to scruffy humans like me and you. I know that uh, Redemption City is a church who loves good, rich, beautiful doctrine. So the concept of God's mercy probably isn't new to you if you've been sitting under Pastor Mike's teaching for any moment of time, amount of time. And I'm definitely not trying to have some like hot new take on God's mercy or, or anything through this teaching. But instead, um, my hope this morning uh, for our time together, kind of together, uh, is, is to kind of engage our, engage our right brains and, and kind of experience God's mercy uh, more, than, more than a fact. Uh, to actually see it in our own lives, not to just see the fact or the doctrine of God's 
mercy, but to, but to kind of experience it anew and see how it actually meets us in different parts in our own stories. A working definition of mercy, uh, just here at the get-go, is mercy is not getting what we deserve, meaning we might justly deserve punishment, rejection, wrath, abandonment, whatever, uh, but then God and his mercy, or even within human relationships, we, we don't get what we deserve, and that's a really good thing. And I have three ways for us to consider God's mercy from this text this morning. Uh, because I'm super fresh out of a Baptist church, Baptist context, they all start with the same letter, uh, which is what you're supposed to do. That's how the Spirit moves. I don't know if you've heard that, but they start the letter in. Man, miss it, message, and movement. We're going to look at God's mercy towards the man, God's mercy in the message, and, and see how God's mercy leads to a movement of repentance. So let's dive in. Look with me at Jonah 3 verses 1 through 3, the first part of 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Here we see God's mercy towards the man, towards the fact that Jonah gets the same call a second time. And I don't want us to miss just the near scandal of this simple part of the story because Jonah flagrantly disobeys God, the, the God of heaven who made the seas and the dry land in his own words. He runs away from that God because he has a better idea. So what does Jonah deserve? To be let go, to just be released to Tarshish and just let life kick him around a little bit. He deserves to be cast out or abandoned out of God's God's presence and God's work and God's mission, but God mercifully pursues him. God's mercy is seen in the storm, which shows Jonah and the sailors that like something ain't right. God's mercy is seen in the big fish that keeps Jonah alive underwater and gives him a place to write some poetry that we looked at last week. And here God and his extravagant mercy calls Jonah to his mission of mercy towards the Ninevites. Guys, this just melts my heart when I think about how, how I pursued my, my own ideas and my life for years, and God just patiently, mercifully pursued me and called me away from that. How he could have let me go, chasing the, the stress and anxiety and worldliness of doing big, impressive things and, and being rich, and, and just how clearly Scripture shows that that is the way to death. Now, how about you? Do you have moments in your life or situations uh, where you've seen God faithfully, patiently, like a loving father, redirecting you, like a little kid that keeps going towards the no-no, and you redirect them and redirect them and redirect them until they finally get it. And then even in his compassionate fatherhood, comforting you, comforting me when the we receive pain, we experience pain because of our bad choices or not listening to him. We see God in his mercy can bring us into his mission no matter what. Being, being useful, and this is such a, a sweet thing of, of uh, God, is that being useful and having meaningful engagement in something bigger than ourselves is so core to, to human well-being. Just having that sense of meaning. And God in his mercy uses people like Jonah, people like me and you, over and over again to be what 2 Corinthians says is ministers of reconciliation. Next, we see God's mercy in the message. Look with me at the rest of verse 3 into verse 4. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. <clears throat> okay, so I just have to nerd out uh, on you for just a, for, for a minute. The book of Jonah, I think Pastor Mike has said this a ton, it's just a literary masterpiece. It was like... So hard to like keep my eye on the prize and not get lost in just like all the sweetness of the book this week as I studied. But structurally, the, the way the, the book, the story is put together, it kind of makes a V uh, kind of shape. In chapter one, you have God calling Jonah to arise and go to Nineveh. But instead, it says he went down to Joppa, bought a passage on a boat and went down into it. Then, of course, he gets thrown into the ocean and goes further down. Uh, to the uh, roots of the mountains, uh, in his own word, uh, which I think is Jonah for rock bottom. And so we see that he's kind of at the root of the mountain, at the, the bottom of the V in the whale. 
and then begins to climb up. He's vomited back on land. Here he gets the call again to arise and go to Nineveh. And it says Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. And in that V structure, there's all these different parallels that, that, that play off each other. Because God's call to Jonah in chapter 1 is paralleled to his call to Jonah in chapter 3. You have the sailors paralleled with the Ninevites later on. It's pretty cool. And then on a linguistic level, it's even more fun. I had the opportunity to kind of pop the hood a little bit on some of the Hebrew, uh, the language that Jonah was originally written in. And there's just all these like really beautiful little nuances in wordplay that just show kind of some of the multifaceted things that are going on uh, in this story. For example, uh, in verse 1 there, I'm sorry, verse 2, um, or I'm sorry, verse 3, there we go, finally got it. It says, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Uh, and you, you probably have a little number there in your Bible, maybe, and a, a footnote that says, the Hebrew says, a great city to God. That's what the, the, the footnote says. And scholars think that that was uh, just an expression, kind of like a Hebrew expression in that day and age, which is why the ESV translators at least translated a, a trans exceedingly great city. Because that's, that's what the expression meant. It was like a... Uh, just a way of saying it was really big or really good. Uh, but also a lot of scholars think that the author is kind of showing some of this some of this nuance, that it's showing God's heart for it, that it was a great, important city to God, both literally because it was big in size, it was almost more of like a district, uh, but then also uh, in his mercy, it was important to him. It, he had compassion towards it, even though it was so wicked. Now, I kind of have a bone to pick with how Jonah's message is typically uh, talked about, at least in some of the sermons that I've heard or read. Uh, and maybe it's because I like identify with Jonah so much, I get a little defensive of him. Uh, but I don't think like the point of this is that is to just like show how pathetic Jonah's sermon is. Uh, you can make a very compelling case for how pathetic it is. It's only seven words in English. Uh, he doesn't even say the, the name God. He doesn't call them to repentance. So easy to just like rag on how pathetic Jonah is and look, we can be pathetic too. It's okay and all that stuff. And that, that might be, that'll preach. Like there might be something in that. But when you go back to that V structure and you look at the emphasis between God's call on Jonah to Jonah in chapter one and you parallel it with the call on Jonah in chapter three, there are different emphases uh, in, in those calls. In chapter one, it, it talks about go to Nineveh because their wickedness has come up against me. Like he's seeing, he's aware of their wickedness. It's the kind of emphasis is God seeing the evil of Nineveh. But then in chapter three, the emphasis uh, in Jonah's calling is to go to Nineveh and call out against them what the message that I tell you, the what I tell you. And we, we, just, we don't have any super clear indication that Jonah did anything other then call out the message that God told him. Uh, or, or even that these words were the only words that he said, uh, that he might have said other things, and this is just a summary. So we can all just, you know, take a chill pill and back off on Jonah's preaching. Um, instead, and instead of ragging on Jonah, I want us to just behold and marvel in the mercy of God in, in this message that he told Jonah to call out against the Ninevites. In this message, can we see God being tender and merciful when he, when he makes sure that wicked people know that destruction is coming? Can we see good in the fact that God is merciful uh, in calling wicked people out of their wickedness? To bring it home a little bit, can we see that God is good and merciful when he uses someone in our lives to call wickedness out in us? With God in his manifold wisdom, he desires to proclaim a message of mercy, to, to warn of destruction. And of course, when you think about it conceptually, it's fairly easy to see that warning people is a mercy. Like it's something they don't deserve. They're, you're, you're just telling them what's going to happen if they continue on that course. Uh, for example, it's a mercy to warn your kid to stop spinning around so much that he gets dizzy and falls on the floor and gets a bloody nose. Not that that's ever happened with any of my kids, but my friend's kids, that happens all the time. So it's a mercy to, to try to prevent bloody noses. But when we put ourselves in the place of the Ninevites, to have your way of life called out, to have your normal way of being labeled as wicked, as evil, it's much more difficult to embrace God's mercy. 
And so I for sure hope that we can see how God's mercy is cozy and comforting. And if you've been walking with Christ, you, you see how it's just followed you all the days of your life. But we also see that God's mercy comes with a little bit of a bite. It requires accurate labeling of good and evil. In God's mercy, in, in the message of God's mercy, we see clearly that sin is serious, that God sees it, he doesn't ignore it, and that judgment is coming, even if it's long in coming, even if there's lots of second chances. And then in the actual language of this message, we see that some of that brilliant literary nuance is at work again, because the Hebrew word that's translated here, overthrown, it actually has a lot of different uses uh, throughout throughout scripture. Uh, it, can, it can mean several things. It can mean judgment, turning upside down, like overthrowing, uh, a reversal, a change, deposing of royalty, or a change of heart. In, in other words, Jonah's, Jonah's words here, the message, could, could mean you 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed, or 40 more days and Nineveh will have a change of heart. Like There's ambiguity in the actual Hebrew to where the, the, the ending of the story has some nuance. Even embedded in the actual words of the message of destruction uh, of the warning is a nuance that seems to allow for mercy, for the deserved punishment to, to be stopped, to not happen. And you see that also in the 40 days of like of the things to talk about in this tiny little message that we have, what is the importance of the 40 days? Why not overthrow Nineveh immediately? It's because God is merciful. Even within the scariness of a message of destruction, there's still more time. Next, we see God's mercy results in a movement of repentance. What's the, the effects of this message of Jonah? Look with me in verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Jonah's message slays the entire city, beginning with the people, with the commoners. And the, and the commoner's response has three parts. There's an inward response, an articulated response, and then an outward response. First, it says that they believed God. That's the, the inward part. They believed the message that justice was coming. And then they declared a fast, uh, which is the, the, the declaration uh, aspect, uh, which one scholar describes as being very different from how they would have typically responded uh, in a situation like this. He says, uh, a normal response for Assyrians to news that the gods were offended would have been sacrifices, libations, supplications, and prostration. But instead, they fast, which is a stillness, which is an emptying. Uh, it's a much more humble, dependent kind of posture. The response we see here to a clear view of coming destruction and God's mercy is not frantic religious activity, but instead it's simple humble embrace of dependency, in this case through fasting. And they put on sackcloth. They weren't trying to hide their need for repentance or, you know, just repent in a small little like, accountability circle, but then like have a really good, you know, public perception. Uh, they, were, they were clear of displaying their, uh, their, their need for mercy. And then we see the king join the movement in verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not drink, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. But the king responds with the same kind of humility. He doesn't, he starts with himself. He doesn't start with his proclamation and starts like, you know, making moves as a king. Uh, instead, he leaves his throne and he removes his royal robes and he humbles himself with sackcloth and he's stationary. He sits in humility in the, in the ashes. And then he continues the movement of repentance with his public declaration where he resonates with the stuff that the people were doing. But then he adds two aspects to it. He says, call out to God mightily, strongly, desperately, and then turn from your evil way and from the violence in your hands. And this seems like some pretty good leadership here. He's furthering the, the move of repentance by urging the people to call out desperately, call out for, for pity. It makes me think of these moments in the gospel 
where Jesus, where people call out for mercy. And, and profoundly, they're, in the gospel, they're almost always, these stories are almost always found like right after an interaction with a rich person or a Pharisee or something. You have uh, Bartimaeus with Jesus saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. Or the parable, parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee in Luke 18, where the tax collector beat his chest and said, Have mercy on me, a sinner. And the, in the king's proclamation, we, we see him uh, calling out for pity that way. And then also we see that necessary to turn to God for mercy requires them to turn away from their evil ways and violence. The king's not mincing words here. He's calling their normal way of life evil. We have to stop it. We, have, we cannot keep going this way if we have any hope to receive mercy and then look how God responds to this movement of mercy in verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God in his mercy relents of disaster. He doesn't destroy this great city. Praise his name. Can we worship him for that? That our great merciful father is clearly slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't deal with us according to our sins. He doesn't repay us according to our iniquity. As Psalm 103 says, God's response shows us that what the, the most important aspect of repentance is. The people and the kings, they did several things. They believed in God, they fasted, they showed dressed in sackcloth to show their humility. But the only thing that God mentions uh, when, when is that they turned. I'm not saying the other stuff is important, but it's right there in the text. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. I think that other stuff is important. I love fasting. It's brought incredible spiritual fruit in my own life. And I think bringing our bodies into spirituality is important. And I think believing God is also very important, believe it or not. Uh, that we have to believe God to make it possible. Believe that he's right and we're wrong. Believe that um, if we don't believe right, that we can't turn from our, from our evil ways. But the thing that at least gets a shout out in verse 10 is the turning from our evil ways. Like incorporating our bodies, believing right is not enough. God's Mercy is like this warming sunrise after a long, cold, dark night. In order to receive it, we have to like get out of the basement, walk outside, climb a hill, receive, put ourselves in a place to receive the mercy, leaving the darkness and walking into the light. Now, there's lots of debate about whether Nineveh's repentance was real or not. Um, historically, like uh, extra biblical historical records, there's not... Uh, anything super clear about Nineveh repenting or anything like that. Uh, though other historians would say that like the culture of the day didn't record things like repentance. It only record, you know, wins, like uh, victories in war or, or what, or conquest. And then there's no record of Nineveh like joining the people of God or anything like that. Uh, but the facts remain that God did relent. He saw their repentance and he did relent of the disaster. And uh, just because I like to side with Jesus in most arguments, uh, when Jesus mentions Jonah, which is kind of crazy when you think about how small and obscure the story is, uh, in Luke eleven thirty two, 32, <clears throat> Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So we don't know all the details of like next steps or follow up with Nineveh, but Jesus seems to think that there will be some Ninevites uh, at the redemption of all things who, who repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now, I have to be honest, alongside just like the sweet soak and mercy that it was to study scripture uh, this week, study the, the story of Jonah here, uh, there was also a big part of me that was really uncomfortable uh, with it, way that I could really identify with how Jonah feels in the next chapter, where he's all grumbly and, and mad at, at the mercy that God showed. That people could be so wicked and just repent and receive mercy, receive pardon. Like, where is the justice? You know, how, how, how would we feel if our families were some of the people that were killed because of the violence in the hands of the Ninevites? And they just repent and they get off the hook. How can God be so merciful? How can he be just and merciful at the same time? 
Well, the answer is Jesus, as it mostly most of, is most of the time in church. But I think this passage in particular gives us just a really beautiful picture, a little glimpse of Jesus in this passage. Look with me back at verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his royal robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Are there any other kings that we know who did that to deal with sin? Jesus is the king. He's the right answer again. He, he rose from his throne in heaven, laid aside his, his royal robes of equality with the God of the universe, with Father God. He emptied himself. He put on the sackcloth of being born in the likeness of sinful man and took on the form of a servant. And then he humbled himself in the dust, in the ashes, by being obedient to the point of death on a cross. He died on the cross as the only human who never needed mercy. He got the justice we deserved so we can receive this extravagant, breathtaking, scandalous mercy of God. We do not get what we deserve because Jesus got what he did not deserve on the cross. In the cross, we see how God's mercy and justice meet. And the story of Jonah calls us to see so clearly the beautiful, merciful character of God who would love us to death. So if you're watching this uh, and, you're, and you're not sure where you are with God, if you haven't received mercy, if you bounce back and forth between feeling total condemnation and being so angry at all the evil you see out in the world, then I invite you to hear this bittersweet message of mercy uh, that comes from Jonah. That justice is coming, that God sees evil, but he sees the evil out in the world and he sees the evil in my heart and in your heart. And judgment is coming. A day is coming when all evil will be dealt with. And the only way to make it, the only way to survive is to believe that God is merciful in Jesus Christ and to turn from your evil ways. We don't have to live in fear of being found out or being stuck in our evil ways. God is merciful. He's forgiving in Christ. And we can turn from that and live the way of Jesus. And Christian, the cry of my heart is that you would hear that God is not mad at you. He's not impatient. He's not frustrated with you. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. And he pursues you in love, even after you're saved. And in his mercy, he has meaningful work for you to do. You receiving mercy <clears throat> from God, <clears throat> excuse me, is part of the work and is the only way to truly do God's work. He wants to send us out to share that mercy as we're filled up with it. He wants us to share this mercy with people stuck in evil, destructive ways. And just like Jonah received mercy and then was an agent of mercy, we are never called to offer to other people what we haven't received already from God. The cry of my heart is that Redemption City would be a church full of people who gratefully, humbly receive God's mercy, who put themselves in the place to receive the sunrise of God's warming mercy, and then enjoy and share that mercy with others, patiently, steadfastly, walking into a really broken, messy, hurting world, walking with people who are on some level very difficult to love and show mercy to, but because God showed mercy to us, we are filled up with that and can pass it on to them in the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit. So this week, practically, really want to bring this down practically. If you want to put yourself in a place to be warmed by the sunrise of God's mercy, I invite you to, to set aside 15 minutes this week. Like seriously, set a timer for 15 minutes and find a quiet spot, get comfortable, and then just sit with your merciful Father. Pray, Father, show me your mercy. And then just ask him to wait for him to show you all the places that he's, you've received mercy throughout your life, because they're there for sure. And your mind wanders, which it will, it's okay. Just bring it back to that one simple prayer. Father, show me your mercy and listen to what the Spirit might bring up. It might be a little bit of a challenge because if you're like me, like your my, my mind went to all these dumb things I did, all these bad ideas I had, all these people that I hurt or whatever, and it was... It was a, a moment of like seeing that as it is, knowing that God was there, seeing it with me, and then just letting him look at me with love. 
knowing that I've received his mercy. Let me pray for us. Oh, Father, I praise you for being such a compassionate, merciful Father. I praise you for your abounding, steadfast love, that you and your ferocious holiness are still merciful to us, and it's all because of Christ, who absorbed all the wrath, all the just punishment for our evil, for uh, our neglect, for the, the murder and brokenness systemically that we see all throughout our society, and also the, the rampant wickedness in our own hearts that we need to be saved from and turn from. Father, my prayer is that we would be people who have deeply experienced your mercy. Forgive us when we distract ourselves and avoid dealing with what is actually in our hearts. And forgive us for, for not putting ourselves in a place to receive your mercy. I pray that we would, we would rejoice at your mercy and that joy would overflow to others. That others would know the good news that in you uh, there's new life through Jesus Christ. In his name. Amen.